So good afternoon, everybody. And um, I always say warm, warm welcome to you. And I mean it very warm welcome to our um, talk, Trisha talk, call it what you will on a Tuesday. And um, today we've got something quite special and a little bit different, um, as you will have seen if you've already spotted Annette. Um, so Annette is very interested in the whole idea of Georgian England. I think that's quite a good uh, summary of, uh, of her passion. And um, so when I had a chat with her a while ago to talk about doing this talk, um, it was fascinating, some of the things that she's involved with. So um, let's cut straight to her and just say uh, welcome to you, Annette. Um, start off by telling us a little bit about, about background before you launch into the whole thing about your association with uh, and passion for George and England. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself to start with. Okay, well, my, my name's Annette. I've um, lived for, I had lived, so let's say, for 40 years in the Yorkshire Dale. I'm originally Scottish by birth, and my mother's Scottish. So a lot of my childhood was spent up there. Um, but my father was in the forces, so we travelled to different places every two or three years. So I never felt really that I had a home. Uh, well, I had a home, but uh, not a home base. So um, I have lived, as I said, I lived for 40 years in the, in the Yorkshire Dales, brought up two children there, was married there, um, very rural country life. Um, working, I worked, um, worked all my life. I was a psychologist originally. I went into industry and worked with people like Unilever, ended up as a school bursar by convoluted story. Um, and now I'm retired and have more time to time trap. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got some water here because I think it, it, during COVID you don't talk to many people, so I end up with taking water all the time. So if I just tell you um, how a bit of my story and how I got to be wearing <clears throat> what I'm wearing today, and indeed what I'm wearing today. Um, when I think about life and how our lives progress. I'm often drawn to an analogy of a forest, paths in the forest. And we're looking for paths and we're traveling through life. And often you can be on a path and you're not looking right or left. You're certainly not looking underfoot to see if it's comfortable and you wouldn't see chasms ahead because you're not looking. And that's great, you say. I agree, that's fantastic. But sometimes more often than not, a dead end comes. And there's nothing you can do at a dead end except give, put your back to it and look for another path. And several years ago, a dead end came for me. And it doesn't matter why, what causes the dead end, it doesn't matter, you, you're there. And when I looked for another path, the mist was out, there were brambles, I just didn't know which way to look. And people said to me, what are you going to do now? And I thought, what am I going to do now? Um, well, what, what I did was Googled dancing in period costume. I've always loved history and I've always loved costume and dressing up and I like fashion and I love to dance. So it, type it in, I never expected to get a response. But in fact, there were groups of people dancing in costume all over the place. And I was very lucky then because one of the groups in the South were ha was having a summer school in Harrogate at J uh, Harrogate Ladies College, which was only half an hour over the moor for me. So I went to the summer school and it, <clears throat> it was dances from the 14th century to the present day all week. So that was a fantastic taster. So I came back thinking, great, what next, what next? And then my children gave me um, a gift for Christmas that year. And it was for the following May, it was a weekend in Lucca in Tuscany. And it was for an event run by a very inspiring woman, Margarita Martinez of the Jane Austen Society Florence, forgive me. And the society is described as, I'll read this so I get it right, a society of lovers of history, dancing, good food, beautiful historic clothes, and a yearning for good company. So I thought that's ideal. And it was a Napoleonic weekend, because it was in Italy, of course, <clears throat> with a grand ball and costume visits, etc. And my daughter agreed to come with me, so that was good. But it meant I had to make two sets of costumes, 
and they were ball dresses and day dresses and all the paraphernalia that goes with it. So I said to him, I made, I got the patterns and I made some costumes and off we went to look at. And it, the bar there was so high, it, I was exposed to something I'd never come across before. And the first evening was a rehearsal for the ball, which was to come. And there was a dancing master. There was all these um, people there, ready, dressed um, still in period costume, but low key practicing. And I was lucky, and we were both lucky. I'd done ballet as a child, I'd done Scottish country dancing. But, you know, there was new terms, rigadon, allemand, um, cotillion, contradons, and, you know, all sorts of things. But something I really learned that evening was, it doesn't matter so much about your feet. What matters is eye contact with the person you're dancing with or the group of people you're dancing with. And people often forget that when they start and they're looking, looking at their feet all the time to make sure they're doing it right. So that was a, a lesson truly learned. That was a time when people met other people. That was their only way of, you know, being introduced, a little bit of flirtation, whatever. So then later on in the weekend, there was the actual ball. They all took place in palaces that we wouldn't have got in otherwise. So it was a way of seeing the world as it was. Napoleon was there, <clears throat> the French guard. Um, and then uh, during the day we visited, um, had picnics, visited exhibitions, etc. So I came back from that weekend with, you know, ready to go, ready to make more costume, ready to find more events, ready to find dancing groups. And um, that's what I started doing, more Googling. <clears throat> so just a little bit about the, the period and the costume. The Georgian period is a very, very long one. You know, George the first was 1714 and um, George the fourth, so it goes into what we call the Regency period. When he was Prince Regent, he became Prince Regent in 1710, um, 1810, and until he became king and when his father, George the third died. And so during that period, costume changes very much. The dances are very similar. But costume changes, it goes from, I always think of it as going from Spitalfield silk to Indian muslin, because it goes from um, very stiff, formal silk, silk brocades, lots of lace, wigs, um, you know, very firm corseting, panniers in your skirts. You can just visualize the costume. And then by 1795, it's, you know, changing. We've got the high-waisted dresses, a very natural form, still got um, the stays, but very natural form, classical looking, and they're wearing um, fine muslin and white. And one of, the, one of the reasons for the change is not the only reason, but one of the reasons was the French Revolution because people didn't want to look aristocratic, but they were because, you know, white muslin gets very, very dirty and you, you want to be rich to have it. So it was all, um, you know, a game really, but, but that's one of the reasons why it all went very simple, changing social values, that sort of thing. So I'll just show you some examples of um, the bits and pieces. This is a, pannier that you would wear on your waist. So you'd start with a chemise. Everybody has a chemise underneath the stays because the chemise went next to the skin and stopped the outer garment, the rich silk, from getting dirty and sweaty. So you could wash a chemise. So everybody has a chemise underneath, just round neck, short sleeves or um, elbow length sleeves. And then your stays or corset, which is a corset's more modern word, which change over the period um, and they're laced usually at the back. So, you know, you have to have a lady's maid or unfortunately I don't have a lady's maid, so it's a little bit more difficult. And then we want to emphasize the hips. So we have these panniers on the side. Now in those, in that period and for, until up to later on, Women didn't carry anything to put their iPhone in or their money or anything else. So they had on top of the pannier, 
but underneath the skirt, underneath the, the dress, they had slits in their dress and they had a pocket, two pockets, one on each hip. And these are two pockets that somebody kindly gave me for Christmas. You can see them here. They were always beautifully embroidered. This one's relatively simple, but very lovely. And they're tied on underneath the dress. So your hand goes through the slit in the dress into the pocket. And hence the nursery rhyme, which has always made me wonder what it was. Lucy Lockett lost her pocket. Kitty Fisher found it. And I used to think, you can't lose a pocket, can you? But that's what it was. These were the pockets. After, when the new dresses came in, in the high, very fine fabrics, etc., you couldn't have a pocket like that. So a reticule was invented. And this is a very simple reticule that I have today. So it's just like a little bag in a shape. And it was called a reticule or even a ridicule because at first it was ridiculed. Well, women carrying these little things, you know, little did they know we'd go on to have the handbags that cost thousands. Well, some people have handbags that cost thousands. So I make, um, I've made lots of things now because I've had to really. There are people out there who make them professionally. Um, but as you can imagine, they're very, very expensive and I just didn't have those funds. So I've had to go making everything. And recently I made some reticules. This one is, um, it's ribbon that's been um, woven, you know, one going one way, one way the other way to make some fabric. Here's another one here. And it's because, um, Somebody posted, uh, it's wonderful if you can get either garments or bits and pieces that are still original because then you can copy them and say, oh, well, I'll make one like that. And somebody posted a reticule like that. So during COVID, I had a go and, and made um, that sort of thing. Here I have my um, parasol, which is, you know, very small. And that was just a lucky find in uh, Market Harbour, almost a junk shop. The silk was absolutely gone, but the handle was still there. And somebody who does repair um, parasols abroad in Milan, in fact, we silked it for me. But it was well worth it because it was such a bargain in the, in the junk shop. And what else? Lo leather gloves, um, that sort of thing. Hats bonnets and wigs. As I say, the wigs went in 1795, William Pitt put a tax on powder for wigs. So wigs went out of fashion, not only because of the French Revolution when they lost their head and lost their wig, but also because um, it was becoming expensive. So powdering wigs went out of fashion and it's just left us with the word powder room, ladies powder room. That's where the expression comes from. So my travels, it then took me, so now I've got the costumes, I've started looking around and I've traveled to different events all over the world. <clears throat> and I've been lucky enough to be able to go um, Luca, Florence, Malta. Malta is a wonderful weekend of very welcoming people. Seville and the Netherlands. And then in England, there are dancing groups. So Hampshire, Worcester, Southampton, and they all have balls. And so I traveled to the balls or sometimes to a weekend. Um, Southampton was interesting because it was in the Dolphin where Jane Austen had her 18th birthday party and we danced in the same room. So, you know, that makes it very special. Um, and the Jane Austen Festival, of course, is in Bath. I'll just tell you about two events, just to um, tell, tell you a little bit more about them, and then I'll show you some photographs quickly. One was in Cornwall, where we went to um, Paul Dark was the attraction, and it was um, to raise money for the air ambulance, Cornish air ambulance. And it was a couple who had a house there that was used in the series, opened it for the evening, and we went um, to the ball and there was an auction and they auctioned, for example, um, 
Ross, I can't remember his name now, Aidan Turner, is it Aidan Turner's shirt? And it went for £4,000 in front of me. I couldn't believe it. I was standing so still in case anybody thought I was bidding, you know, all these items. But they raised a lot of money that evening for um, the air ambulance. And then the next day we went to the mine and that sort of thing, you know, in, in costume. So that was a bit special. And the other very special one, which I enjoyed, was going to Versailles because I've been to Versailles before as a tourist, but I'd never been as I did on the evening. I stayed in a hotel, a room, um, quite near the palace, let's go to the palace, because I had to walk there. So I knew I, had, I was wearing this full rig out, rig out. And I got to the Golden Gates and they opened. And I went through and everybody was in period costume then. You couldn't go in if you weren't in costume. And there was, 100, 200, and they surged up the stairs and into the king's apartments. You know, we'd come to see the king, and there was dancing in the um, gallery de glass, um, cards playing in one of the rooms. The king occasionally walked by with some mistress or other, I'm sure. But it was stepping back in past, in the, to the past. And I guess that's what the, one of the attractions is. It's feeling as though you were there. And all these things I've gone on my own, apart from the first one um, with Sophie, and she did come to Cornwall. It's not her thing. And, you know, I have lots of friends that I love dearly in the Dales, et cetera, but they weren't, they're not interested. This, this was my interest. And I thought you either do it on your own or you don't do it. So I do, I do, I've done it on my own. And I've met so many lovely people along the way that, you know, I'd like to make, I think I've made a lot of new friends. So if I can just share my screen, I'll show you a few photographs. It only lasts two minutes, and then I'll go on to the next bit. Of the Just a final bit. I was traveling so much and coming back to the Dales, obviously that's where I lived, that I thought, you know, it's time that I moved somewhere where I was, it, there was more dancing. There, there isn't dancing up there, believe it or not. And so I decided to move to Bath. And during COVID last year, I sold the house and bought a Georgian apartment that I'm sitting in now, downsized. Um, got my few windows, etc. And 
I, I thought, well, when I want to see my friends, I'll go the other way. What difference does it make? It doesn't make any difference. Obviously, COVID has made it a bit different because the events have been cancelled. I haven't been able to meet people quite the same. But we've done a lot on Zoom, as I'm sure all of you have. You know, people like um, Libby Kurtz and has Mrs. Bennett's Ball, and we go every Saturday and play Regency games. And then we have a soiree every month and dress up and carry on doing it. People have run dance classes. Um, I know there's people online, um, I can see the names now, where they run classes and we go along and carry on dancing in our own room um, here. But when we get back on the ballroom, it will be really difficult because I'm not used to people getting in the way now. You know, I have the whole room and I just dance with who I like. So um, anyway, we're carried on and look forward to, you know, there's going to be the Bath Festival is going to happen this year. So that's 10 days of period costume. Um, I'll actually be here for it. So I'm looking forward to that. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope I haven't gone on too long. You absolutely haven't gone on too long. It's been absolutely brilliant. I've loved, I, I loved it. Um, I, I've got loads of questions I want to ask you. Um, so were you already, you must have been quite a skilled um, dressmaker. No, I, I sewed as probably a lot of people did. When I was a student, I wanted more clothes than I could afford to buy um, and ball dresses then. So I sewed then. And then when the children, when Sophie especially, when she was very little, I would make her dresses, smock dresses or something. But I, beyond that, no. And so I had to pick up skills again and dig out the sewing machine and whatnot. Okay, but, and do you make all your, you make all your costumes? I do, um, I do. And mine are, you know, there are people out there with far superior costumes and I go to things and I think, oh, I feel like I could get to that level. Um, but I enjoy doing it and I enjoy the creativity of it. Where it, So now I've got to the stage where I'm thinking, yeah, I'll do that, I'll pleat that bit instead of this. And that's giving me lots of pleasure. Uh, yeah. Um, what was impressive about those photographs that you showed us was the quality of the um, of everything, um, the quality of the clothes, um, the degree I, I would think of um, realism. You know, the, the the precision with which people had chosen the designs and so on and so forth. You can see that people have gone to an enormous amount of trouble to get it right. And the other thing, um, are there as many men as women interested, or is it largely uh, female? Um, I would say there's, as in a lot of things. Down in particular there are more women than men um, but that doesn't mean there are no men and especially with traditionally reenactment historical reenactment has always been military based so there's a lot of um, men who are in the corps Napoleon's guard or whatever but you know they danced in the evening they went to balls you know the night before Waterloo was one of the biggest Duchess of Richmond's ball that's been reenacted so there are men that way and they're young, they're not all elderly, um, so there's a lot of young men involved. So yes, there are men. The good thing though is that the dancing is in groups, you know, sets as in um, Scottish country dancing. And women can dance with women because that's what happened. Men went to war and women had to dance with women. Just something like when you watch the Jane Austen films, you know, when Kitty shouts, let's, let's dance, let's dance. And they get up and dance. Well, that, that's what we do, you know, yeah. any excuse. Yeah. And um, uh, just a question about costume. So what do you do about shoes? Well, my, you can buy shoes. I have a pair of Georgian leather shoes. There are people who make reproduction shoes. So they're very expensive. Um, so I've only got one pair, maroon they are, and they have buckles on them. Um, when it gets to the next period, of, so they've got heels, Louis the 14th type heels. Um, when it gets to the Regency period, they're flat, flat slipper like, and so ballet shoes will do, but you know, you've just got to keep your eye open for things. But there are one or two people making them, and they're probably a good investment because, you know, they last long. And they wore little boots. You know, when the, when the Regency people went out during the day, I've got some white boots, ankle boots with laces. Now they were jazz boots, believe it or not, but they're ideal for it. So. 
Lovely. Um, uh, what, what else do I, um, if anybody else has questions for Annette, do put them in the chat function because we, we will be coming back to her afterwards for, um, uh, so that she can answer any questions that you've got. H how about um, researching patterns and things? Do you, do you have to make your own patterns or is it the no, sort of thing? There are companies, like who, people and companies who do that. So there's four or five companies around the world um, and you just have to get, you know, just have to learn where they are and buy the pattern. Yeah. Um, and the patterns, of course, are very, very different. You know, the, the Regency pattern was the, the sleeves were very inset, the shoulders were in a different place. So but once you've got that, you can start adapting the patterns and um, playing around with it. But yes, you do have to seek out the patterns. Would you like to just um, describe exactly what you're wearing at the moment and what period would that have been typical of? And, you know, let's... Well, let's probably be about, it. you know, 1810 or something. So I'm Regency period now. I've got, I have worn this dress to a ball. Um, it is silk, but I can, I mean, silk could be worn during the day, but I put a chemisette underneath it. Now, a chemisette is um, like a mock, shirt so it only comes to here it ties underneath the gown and it's got a little collar but you could have a rock or you could have whatever and that was for modesty's sake during the day um that's what's underneath could so you actually, could you stand up just so yeah. that we can see a little bit more of it so, uh, that's absolutely gorgeous it's, it's pleated over the over yeah, the bust and then and then it's sleeves. puff sleeves bit on the hem and yeah then i've lined this one because it was a bit secret and i shan't undress but underneath i've got um stays corset uh, which was the, the regency period um the bone the big wide bone bust went down the middle because they wanted the breast lifted up and separated right so, that's what it's meant to do. You see it more in an evening gown. Yeah. Um, and then underneath that, I've got the chemise, of course, to, to wear underneath it. Yeah. We wore white stock, stockings. So the stockings are made of wool or silk, mine of cotton fur. And then they're tied with garters. The garters are tied. Um, and then there's little pumps. Um, so, of course, you couldn't show your ankles, but you could show your. <laughs> You could show you bosom. The dresses were all the evening dresses are all very low cut because that was you know a sign of beauty. So as you get older, it's a bit more difficult. And then you always had a you didn't have um you always had a shawl. I've got my shawl here today. Um they wore you, you've seen them on the Jane Austen films, little um spencers, they're called little jackets that stop here, and then a police is Spencer with skirts on it, so like a coat um, for the colder periods. But you weren't allowed to show that you were cold. You know, you were meant to be out in your skimpy gowns. Um, <laughs> and a lot of you know, young girls in the Regency were dumping their gowns to make them stick more to their figure. And you know, it was just a little bit. Um, it was, I've never damped a gown, you know. <laughs> And pass that with you. And one and, thing, one thing that you have to remember when you're in this costume is the order to put things to get dressed. Because if I put, if I didn't, if I didn't put my stockings and shoes on first, I wouldn't get them on. Because if I put the stays on, I can't bend to the <laughs> stockings and shoes. Unless you had it, your maid, and then your maid would do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have a maid. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and your hat, that would have been typical of that 18. Yeah. So this is a, yeah. 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 Or, and you could have a bonnet. Um, I've got a bonnet for you. That's quite military looking, that hat, in some ways, isn't it? With the so wisdom. Um, oh, wow. It's a rather nice bonnet that someone's made professionally, Jane Walton. Um, so that's quite a nice bonnet. And this one, this one was very enterprising. It started out as a sun hat and it was cut at the back and then a floppy bit put on here. 
I think Sophie was on one of the photographs wearing it. Um, so yeah, it's just a case of playing around with it. It, it, they're, they're so beautiful. I think one of the things that's so attractive about it is just how um, it, how attractive and pretty the things are. Really, they're they're, they're lovely, aren't they? They're, they're very feminine, and uh, um, you know, I mean, you you look fantastic in that outfit. <laughs> I, mean, you can't, I can't describe to you the feeling of mm -hmm. the. You do feel different mm -hmm. when you're in sure. costume, and you have to have all the what we call the underpinnings mm -hmm. in order to make you feel that way and you do feel you don't feel like Annette from the 21st century dressed up you yeah. feel as though you are really at the palace of Versailles yeah, yeah. um but, I had to go home and take it all off but um, it was fun it's, I was there. it's beautiful it's brilliant I love it I love I love everything about your story, I really do. The fact that it's been, it's given you such an incredibly new lease of life, really, and um, interest and hobby and pursuit and friendship and 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 a, and a move to a different part of the country as well. I think I think I would just say well, my last my last thing I'm, I'm going to say, I promise, is when you're when you're on that path and you turn around and you don't know what to do. Just do anything you can. I had a rule that I would never say no to an invitation or to anything. And then when you find something that excites you just a little bit, do it again. And then it might grow into a passion because mm -hmm. that's what excitement leads to. Mm -hmm. Just keep looking for it. Yeah, well, it's wonderful. It's very, very, very uh, inspirational. I love it. I really So um, I'll come to Bryony now and ask uh, uh, for questions. Yeah, we have had a few questions. Um, so Annette, the first question is from Hilary. She wants to know whether Georgians wore spectacles. Yes, I think they did. I, yes, I, I think, I think pretty sure they did. I'm trying to think of somebody who ordered some. There might be something in Jane Austen, maybe somebody will know better than me, where they order spectacles. I mean, I have sunglasses. Um, which are the correct shape for the period. My daughter bought them for me in Colonial Williamsburg in, in America. I guess some people have actual glasses made up in the right. old fashioned frames. Yes. Okay, perfect. And do you wear a period wig? Are you wearing a wig at the moment or is that your hair? If I was in Georgian in a period, I could wear the big wigs. Mm -hmm. My own hair is very short and boring and I can't do any more of it. So I have to wear a wig. So today I've just got on a scratchy wig underneath and I'm just, I've, I've just added curls at the side. So yes, personally, I have to wear a wig, but people ah, okay. with longer hair. And how do you curl? Do you use heated tongs or do you tie Well, it? these ones were magic. I um, read online, somebody posted uh, where you start with the, um, whatever they're called, long pieces of hair, and you sew it all together so that it's, you've got a bit like this, put it round your roller and put it in boiling water for seven minutes, then let it dry and the curls never go, never go away. <laughs> so I did That's that amazing. and I'll, I'll, do, I'll make some more because it was great. That's and that, is, is that real hair? No, it's pretend hair. It's pretend. It's yeah. It's not real hair, but it worked. It was somebody online who. Perfect. And um, Pat would love to know: Did they wear makeup? Um, and if so, what makeup did they wear? Well, the Georgians wore a lot of makeup, and they wore mm. their skin had to be very, very pale. So this is the older period with the mix and everything. Mm -hmm. So your face would look whitish almost, and you'd have little red cheeks here and little red lips and very black eyebrows and perhaps even a patch or two. Um, but when it moved into the Regency period, it becomes far more natural looking because they want to look, you know, this natural form. So that's fine if you're a very young, beautiful girl, but of course it's more difficult when you get older. So that so you've got to be a bit like we are now, Trisha, wearing makeup that makes us look like we're not wearing makeup. <laughs> Amazing. And then a question from Joan as well. She'd love to know what sort of food is served at the events that you attend? Food. Yeah. Um, well, the food is usually of the period. Mm -hmm. So um, they ate a lot of 
the sweet things, um, syllabub. I mean, remember if it's a ball, you're not eating a heavy meal. You usually have dinner before you went to the ball. The ball started okay. quite late and the supper was later still. So you'd sometimes be having supper at midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and it tended to be light food, you know, like things in jelly or, um, as I say, lots of syllabub, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. You'd have a big pineapple. Whether anybody ate it or not, probably not. It was a sign <laughs> of status to have that sort of thing. Um, right. Yeah. So okay. we do try to keep within the period. Perfect. And um, just a final question. Someone's messaged me separately saying, do you play the harp uh, that's behind you? Do you know how to play the harp? My daughter plays the harp. It's her harp. Um, she's, she reached quite a high level. She started with piano. But as anybody in the watching has children, they'll know that when they leave, you are left with a lot of things <laughs> until they have room for it. So yeah. one day she'll take, my place will look a lot emptier, she'll take things. By the moment it fits nicely, so. It looks lovely. And it is tuned and strung, so all we need is somebody to play it. <laughs> well, thank, play. thank you so much. I'll hand that good to Trisha now. I've, I've got a couple of questions just to finish on. One is, um, I, with your move to Bath, do you, are you... Are you thrilled to be in Bath, and 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 is does that really help to support this sort of feeling that you have that you inhabit this uh, this other world, if you like, from from the past? Yes, I, COVID's made it difficult, as I said, and I bought the apartment without seeing it. And my mum said to me, "I've never bought a pair of shoes without seeing them." And I said, "Yeah, but times change, mum. You know, this is what we do." <laughs> I love the apartment, I love the views, I love the light, I love the architecture of Bath. And the first thing I did, I bought a book called 15 Walks in the, in the Centre. And I, I've gone round like this, and everything's up high that they're pointing out, you know, a bit on a building. So the history is, you're walking amongst it every day. So I, I, I yeah. just love it. It's, yeah. it's a very beautiful city. I would recommend if you haven't been, please come because it's beautiful. Yeah. It is beautiful, and as you say, it's it's like you're walking in in the history that yes. you you're already sort of in your mind. Uh, you've obviously gone a long way there to uh, inhabit that place, um, which which I think is absolutely fantastic. And my second question is, um, what what's coming up in the near future? Have you have has anything been planned? You know, for yes. Uh, um, I haven't heard, people are hoping to have, um, balls will be the last thing, won't it, because it's touching and there's quite a lot of people there. But we do have, somebody has organised a house party in August, so there'll be 32 of us staying in um, Gloucestershire for a week, where we'll have our own balls and soirees and card parties, etc. So we're doing that sort of thing. Yeah. And as I say, the Jane Austen Festival is going ahead and there's two balls there yeah. the beginning and end. So by September, August, September, hopefully things will yeah. be a bit more. Everybody's yeah. hoping that, whatever you do, but I hope so. Good. Well, I hope so too, because it sounds absolutely brilliant. So um, thank you so much, Annette. I think that was wonderful. I really do. I think it was a wonderful little window onto a whole other world and uh, time, and you've evoked it perfectly. Um, full of admiration for your costume, uh, full of admiration for the, um, for the degree to which you have embraced this whole new direction in your life. I mean, talk about wholehearted. And it's obviously opened up this entire world for you which, uh, you know, is a massive part of, um, of who you now are, you know, mm. you've, become, you've become this, this other person as a result. And uh, I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's a wonderful testament to what's possible when, as you say, you get to a dead end and you decide to turn around and find a different path. And you found an amazing path mm. with uh, what you're doing there. So well done. And it's uh, lovely to hear. And thank you for your story. And thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you for your allowing me to do so. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure and I'm sure that everybody watching this has absolutely loved it. So bye-bye and bye-bye to everybody and thanks for joining us uh, as always. So goodbye. <laughs>